Well, welcome to God, Where Are You? And right now we are in part eight. That's right. It's called A Place of Revelation. And we're just glad you joined us. Now, currently right now, this is this is pre-recorded for you, what we're doing right now, because Josie and I are away on vacation with family, so... That's right. We're probably sitting on the beach right now in yeah. South Carolina. <laughs> but we didn't want to miss a week with you, so we have this available to you. So um, we, you won't see us able to communicate back and forth, but feel free to still make your comments as long as they're nice. <laughs> um, because now we'll be watching the comments with you. But um, this is... Um, a place of revelation, uh, that's what the title of, of today's is. And actually, uh, John Bevere was saying this is his favorite aspect of the wilderness. And I've got to say that um, I haven't realized it, but this really is uh, a favorite part of the wilderness for myself as well. And, and um, when you're asking that question, God, where are you? And it's when God reveals himself to you and you spend so much time in a wilderness season many times whether it's short or whether it's long um, just the circumstances of it all can wear you out but then all of a sudden you get a fresh revelation of God and you got to value that you got to hold on to it but uh, before we start um, we're just going to go to Lord in prayer and we ask you just to join us together. So Lord, I pray your hand of blessing on this teaching, your hand of blessing on us as we uh, lead everyone through this session. And Lord, I pray that you would give each person a fresh revelation of actually what you're doing in their life and where you are leading them to. And Lord, I pray that we would encounter you. We'd encounter your presence and we'd Take a step deeper in our walk of faith with you. Bless each person as they, as they tune in. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. So in um, this part, it's a place of revelation. And basically when God wants uh, to separate us to himself, he sometimes has to remove us from other voices that influence our lives. In scripture, he physically did that with people like Moses, with David, with Paul, with John the Baptist. Think about King David. Well, before he was king or he was anointed as king, but think about when, when King Saul was hunting him down and David is hiding in, in caves with some of his men. And during those seasons, he had to be like, God, what are you doing? Right. But it's those those times when he was being hunted and he was desperate for the Lord is where some of the Psalms come from. And those Psalms minister to us to this very day. Mm -hmm. So that's what's amazing. It's um, those times when you're um, in that wilderness, the Apostle Paul, John the Baptist. So it's, it's in those seasons that holiness is produced in us and holiness enables us to see God, and through seeing God, we become marked for the calling that he has for our life. So it was what God revealed to these people in the wilderness that enabled them to be who God created them to be, and even develop some of the gifts that they had um, that may not have been developed unless they were in that wilderness season. It was what caused them to cry out to God, knowing that God had more, maybe that knowing that God had, right. had spoken to them, maybe that God had uh, revealed to them some of the plans he had for them, but then they get to the wilderness time, the dry time. Um, I think of the, um, the Apostle Paul when he had that amazing encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, and then he goes off to, to Arabia and uh, that's not the normal process that someone who wants to be an apostle for God would have taken. But um, it's a process that he had to go through. It's a process that he needed to go through. Um, Isaiah 40, verse 3. Josie, will you read that for us? Sure. It says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. 
make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So it's, it's interesting where in that verse that you could actually read it like this mm -hmm. if you just changed where the colon is in this verse. and um, Because modern day translators put our punctuation in there. Exactly. Yeah. So the punctuation where they put it may or may not have been where we have put it. So we're just talking about a colon, and I'm saying you can, don't be offended by this, but you can possibly read it like this. If you don't want to read it like this, it's fine. Don't get mad at me. I'm just saying you can. It said, um, the voice, um, change the colon and look at it this way. Uh, the voice of one crying, and there you got your colon, put it right there. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting when you can look at it that way. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. A highway is prepared in the wilderness. Right. And that's why we take a look at it that way. Maybe it can be read that way because a highway was prepared in that place of wilderness. So what is the highway? Look in Isaiah 35, and uh, we'll take a look at that in verse 1 and verse 8. Go ahead and read that, Joseph. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. A highway shall be there and a road, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. Shall not go astray. And look at that. It says, it shall be called a highway of holiness. The highway of holiness. Why is that so important? Look at Hebrews 12, verse 14. And in, the, in Hebrews it says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. It says right here, without holiness... No one will see the Lord. So when you hear see the Lord, don't limit it to just when I die, I will not see the Lord. Think of it like this. Now, both of us, Josie and I, have lived through many presidents. Some of you who are watching um, have lived through even more presidents of the United States than us. Um, but I have personally never met a president of the United States. Uh, I've seen them, but never personally met any of them. And I've never been in their presence, in the presence of the president of the United States. And there's other people, though, who work for the president on a daily basis. There's other people who, who meet with him um, or who serve him or are friends of him, even at a, a more intimate level, who are friends of him and see him daily. And they are in his presence regularly. So when the writer of Hebrews says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy, because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. This means that if you really want to be in the presence of God, the creator of the universe, of everything that exists, the creator of, of every person, if you want to be in his presence, that's greater than the presence of the <laughs> president of the United States. For sure. <laughs> and if you want to be in his presence, the greatest of all, then you really need to pursue holiness. And we don't actually hear a lot of talk about holiness anymore. Right. I think maybe there's times when I grew up that I heard talk about holiness. But nowadays, it's like... Um, like the seeker-friendly church. Right. Took that aspect and watered it down a bit. And, and there is an aspect of the grace of God, mm -hmm. where God's grace cleanses you of all your sin and, and covers your sin. But there's also... Um, a part that we play 
once we are saved, once we've been transformed, once we've experienced his grace, that his grace is meant to empower us, to help us live the life that we can't live on our own. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That means live a life of holiness. That means living a life that is set apart, living a life that's distinct, where we don't look like the world, we don't act like the world, we don't talk like the world. Sure. There's, there's a purpose to that. You are called out from the world for a reason. Keep that in mind. So many times Christians say, oh, well, I'm saved, so it really doesn't matter how I live mm -hmm. and it doesn't make any difference. Well, I will say it makes a great deal of difference right. of how much you want to be in the presence of God and how much you want of his presence in you to, to be lived out through you and to accomplish the things that only God can accomplish in and through you. Right. You, his word says to work out our salvation. Yeah. With fear and trembling. Fear and trembling. <laughs> That's right. Um, and that means that he's a holy God. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to be in the presence of God, then you really need to pursue holiness. Mm -hmm. And so God is attracted to holiness. God wants you to live that kind of life. So the wilderness is a place where you pursue holiness. Think about that. The place, the situation, I, I've thought about this as we were preparing for this, that the situations that you find yourself in where you kind of like, God, why are you doing this? God, why did I have to go through this? And instead of complaining about it, thinking like, wow, this is the place where God is revealing all of the the junk in me that he really can't use and needs to, I need to get out. And it's a place where I could have deeper intimacy with him. And it's a place where I can pursue his presence. Right. So the wilderness is a place where you pursue his presence. Because we can't, if we don't go through these times, we won't see our own impurities. Mm -hmm. um, the times where... Um, I have stuff in my life that is not pleasing to God. Usually it doesn't come to the surface. Usually it's hidden deep down. And maybe it's a wrong attitude. Maybe it's a wrong heart. Um, uh, something wrong in the, in the way that I process things. But normally you can stuff down those emotions and you really don't have to deal with them. And other people don't necessarily have to see them. But when the pressure's on, what happens? That stuff that's deep down usually comes to the surface. Right. It's in those wilderness times, is during those, those desert times where the impurities do what? We learn this from the purifying process. They rise to the top. They become, they come out from what's hidden and they become very obvious. Right. And it's the wilderness or it's the furnace of the desert, the furnace of affliction, it says in his word. It's the time of testing. It's what exposes our impurities. It's what causes them to rise up to the top. And all of a sudden, what was invisible, what was easily easy to hide, easy to stuff down, all of a sudden, it becomes visible. Have you ever experienced that kind of a moment where something comes out? whether it's in anger or whether it's in frustration, and something comes out, you're like, wow, where was that? <laughs> I, I didn't mean to say that. I mean, oh, it's always been there. Right. It's always been stuffed down. And in the time of the pressure, mm -hmm. it rises to the surface right. and comes out. And so there... That's why there's a saying, I said that in the heat of the moment, because the heat brought it out. Very good, <laughs> yes. yes, that's right. The heat of the moment. So if we're honest, if, if you're living in, in sin or if you're disobeying the Lord or if you're not or, or you've given up in a certain area and you're not following him as, as closely as you once were, then you're not going to enjoy the presence of the Lord. That's right. Once again, his presence is attracted to holiness. And so once those things, that, those unholy things are exposed, we have an opportunity to remove them from our life. Um, but if you're living in sin, 
if you're listening, living in disobedience to God, or even as we were talking last week, if you're trying to fulfill things in you know, your, your methods of accomplishing God's work, then, then you're not going to have the deep intimacy with God that you could have because it's uncomfortable. And uh, John Bevere was using this illustration, and I'll just um, use it myself, talking about me and Josie. See, if I was committing adultery against Josie, not only would I not be sitting here and I wouldn't still be breathing and alive. Be a little uncomfortable. Yeah, (laughs) very (laughs) uncomfortable. Um, But I could technically still be married to her. But there's going to be an invisible wedge between us. There's going to be trust is going to be broken. There's not going to be real communication there's going to be some serious glares and some, some looks. Um, but here's another thing. If I'm living um, in a relationship with someone else, but yet still trying to keep my relationship with Josie, um, trust is broken, so there's not going to be, she's not going to share the secrets of her heart with me. Why? Because she can't trust me with the secrets, with the deep things. And... Uh, when you see God's presence, that's, that means, in other words, when you see in Scripture or see it's written, it talks about God's presence. That is nothing other than intimacy with God, right. where God shares his secrets with you. Mm-hmm. God shares his secrets with those that he loves, but not just loves, those that he can trust. Right. Question to ask yourself. Write it down. Can God trust you? With his secrets. See, the only way that you get there is with intimacy with him. And is if he can trust you. So it's a lot of times people have asked John Bevere, um, like when he writes his book, they says, where do you get the wisdom that you write in the books? And he says, it's in the intimacy. It comes from my intimate times right. with the Lord and God reveals his secrets to me and I, write, I simply write them out. Mm-hmm. And so he says, that's why I don't want to commit adultery against God and live in a world, uh, in the world and, and lust after the things of the world and desire the things of the world and be entertained by the world because it's a cheap replacement for the intimacy right. that you can have with God. Mm-hmm. It's a cheap fulfillment. Think about that. If you're constantly desiring the world or trying to be pleasing to the world or let the world please you, you can pick whichever way that you want to do it. But it's such a cheap replacement for what God has for you. Right. The fulfillment that he can have for you and what he wants to provide in your life. So that's why when you think about committing adultery against God, Think about it, what that actually means, loving the things of the world more than you love God or spending time in the things of the world, listening to the voice of the world more than you spend time in his word, more than you seek his word or pray with him. So you don't want to commit that offense against God and live in a that type of world. I don't want to lose my intimacy with God, and I hope you don't want to lose your intimacy with God either. It's important to understand that one of the benefits of the wilderness is God saying, I am giving you an opportunity to pursue me and to step into my presence. But God will not have uncleanness in his presence. And here is why. If God was to manifest his glory in the presence of willful sin, then you would have a situation like in Acts 5 where it's Ananias and Sapphira. In, in that situation, uh, they were coming to the temple and they were giving a, a great gift to the Lord. And it was a good thing that they were doing, but they lied about it. So simple thing of lying about the gift that they were giving. And they were acting like they were giving all that they had when they had it. And so they're kind of bragging and, uh, and doing, they're being dishonest. Drop dead right on the spot. Right. Why? Because of the glory of God, his presence was so strong. And it says that during that time, 
the presence of God was so strong on Peter that as Peter walked down the streets, they were lining up people, the sick, the, the, those that were lame and sick, they're laying them on the sides of the streets. And as he passed by, his shadow would pass over them and they would be healed. The shadow that speaks of the glory of God was on him in such a strong way because he had been in the presence of God. Right. And so God's presence was the thing that was empowering him and was strong on him. And that's why God gives us the privilege of the wilderness because he wants to reveal himself to us more than we want him to be revealed. We don't he, always think of the wilderness as a privilege yeah. to walk through, but it really is the privilege to be able to put things aside and really zone into what God's doing in your life. Yeah. yeah. It's an alone time where he actually pulls If we you. allow it to be. Yeah. If we can put the other things aside. If we can put the social media aside, the TV aside, yeah. the news aside. If we can put those things aside and actually get into a wilderness. Yeah. So many times we're drawn to a wilderness, but we dig our heels in. And even though he set up a wilderness time for us, we're so busy doing other things that we don't actually get in the wilderness. We bring our TV into the wilderness. We bring our social yeah. media into the wilderness, especially in these times now. We're worried about who's rioting. We're worried about who's protesting. We're worried about what monuments are standing. We're worried about if we're going to school, if we're not going to school, wearing a right. mask, not wearing We're worried about all these things. We're bringing that into our wilderness time where we could be laying all that aside and getting into God's presence and saying, where are we going from here? And I see so many Christians getting caught up online on social media in fighting over things that really in eternity's perspective matters very little right. and b having big arguments just so they can be right and uh, letting their voice be heard. And the reality, if you're saying that, the reality is this, that they're missing out with time with God so that they can be heard by some person out there right. about what their opinion is. Right. This is a wilderness time. We're in different yeah. times. We're isolating ourselves in that. But um, if we can use it as a true wilderness and dig deep into the presence of God, we might find something on the other side of this that we weren't, we yeah. wouldn't be prepared for if yeah. we hadn't gone through it. I also think we're so conditioned for um, entertainment. We're an entertainment society. We don't know what to do with silence. Oh, my right. goodness. I've got a moment of silence. What do I do with that? <laughs> and uh, or, or we're so much of a doing people. Let me do, 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 you know, continually doing stuff to earn approval or right. um, something like that, that we don't know what to do with silence and stillness. Right. And that's where God speaks. Yes. And you'll never hear him unless you close your mouth. That's a word of the Lord to somebody. <laughs> you will never hear the because you can't talk and hear at the same time. Mm. So you will never hear the word of God if you're constantly talking. And so write that down if you need to. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but you'll never hear a word from the Lord if you have to be busy, busy, busy. And... You'll never experience his presence if you have to be going here and going there and doing this and doing that. And you're never still. God is a God who wants to sit with you, love on you, share his secrets with you. And he does that in the wilderness. Um, he wants to reveal himself to you more than you want him revealed. And that's the whole reason God brought the children of Israel into the wilderness to bring them to the mountain of the Lord. You notice when Moses, he kept saying to Pharaoh um, again and again, let my people go. Here's the purpose. So that they may worship the Lord in the wilderness. He's not lying to them. Actually, when I was young, when I was a kid, I used to think, oh, he's just lying to them. You know, they, they, no, that's the purpose. It's not to go to the promised land. It's go to the meet. Moses is taking the, the children of Israel to the same place 
where the bush was burning, where he experienced God's presence, and God spoke from that bush that did, was not consumed by the fire, and God spoke to him, and he had an encounter with God. That is where Moses is taking the children of Israel. They've been slaves for all their lives. They don't even know who they are. They don't know what they've been called to. And, and Moses is saying, come on, I've got to... Pharaoh, you got to let these people go so they can worship the Lord in the wilderness. And I'm going to take them to the place where I met him so they can meet him like I met him. And so they need to meet this God that I met. And I need them to experience what I experienced. Their lives will be changed. They'll never be the same. And that's what Moses is doing. That's right. And yet, that's his goal, to take them for a worship experience so they can experience what God's doing. That was, that's what causes Moses to have no desire to return to Egypt. Yet you see the children of Israel complaining again right. and again and again about it was better for us back there. Well, you see, for Moses, nothing could compare to God's presence like he experienced. I mean, Egypt was the most lush, rich place in the world. Yet it never compared to what God's presence was like. So me, Moses has this experience with the presence of God. And he knew how wonderful it was. And he knew how nothing could compare to that. And so the writer of Hebrews said that he forsook the comforts of Egypt because he was looking for a reward. And his reward was the presence of God. Moses, when he brought the children of Israel out, he was headed right to Mount Sinai, and that's where the burning bush was. And he's thinking, I want you guys to meet God just like I met him. And you'll see what uh, Exodus 19, this is what the Lord speaks over the children of Israel. This is all, all of them, not just all three million of them, not just like one, not just Moses. Um, this is what God speaks. And Josie, why don't you read that Exodus 19, 4 through 6. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests mm. and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. He's telling them who they are. Mm -hmm. What were they? In their mind, they were nothing but slaves. In their mind, they, they weren't free at all. And so God had to tell them who they were. But this is what he does. He, he brings them. He has Moses bring them to him so he can tell them as a loving father that I got plans for you, that I want to bless you. I want to prosper you. You got to realize that you are how awesome you are. You're and a special treasure. I yeah, love the way that's worded. Special treasure. Mm -hmm treasure that's the things that we want to speak over our kids right that's that's the thing we want to love on our kids and that's what god wanted to speak to his own children because here's why god wants nothing more than a relationship with you he doesn't want to just come to you and point out your sin and point out how many things or judge you and say how many ways that you messed up god wants to love on you and a lot of times we simply miss the basics that God wants to tell you how, how proud he is of you right now. And I think of this. I think of times when um, Josie was pregnant with, with our four kids. And uh, what are some of the, in those nine months, Josie, that you were pregnant, what's some of the things that you experienced that me as a dad, as a male, I, I couldn't experience those things. I just had to wait nine months and then I get to meet my kids, but what were some of the things that you experienced during those times? Right, well, you experience your belly growing and not being able to see your feet anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you experience the first time that you feel them flutter around in there and, and then um, later on kick and, and your stomach looks like an alien's in there moving and all over the place and kicking up on your ribs and yes. you know getting uncomfortable towards the end. But <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, it's a constant reminder that you're carrying that baby within you. It's with you always, everywhere you go. It's being fed off of you, yeah. nurtured. Yeah. All that. You, you are. I talk to it and sing to them. And yeah. You are providing everything for it. Right. You still provide everything for the kids. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you're providing everything for it. You're their source. You are their source. Right. 
Here I am as a dad on the outside saying, man, uh, although I do remember the times where I saw the child moving mm-hmm. in, in your stomach like, whoa. And I do remember right. us saying that like, it's an alien. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, the child's in there. And, but imagine the day comes and, and delivery room, you're delivering the children and, um, and one of our child's comes out and as soon as they see me I'm like yes finally I get to meet my kids and and finally this this kid comes out and he he sees me and um I'll just pick on Elias for a minute and Elias (laughs) comes out and he screams at the top of his lungs I mean they were doing that anyway when they came out but they (laughs) scream and and they see me like who is that man? Oh, I don't want anything to do with him (laughs) it's like keep that man away from me right and they're they're scared imagine that Right. That's what the children of Israel did with God. Right. When he brought them to the mountain of the Lord, to Mount Sinai, so he could speak to them, so he could love on them. He delivered them to bring them to himself. Right. And they screamed in terror and said, Moses, you speak to God. Right. It would be like Elias saying, wait, give me my allowance first. <laughs> and then screaming <laughs> and yes, leaving. Yeah. yeah. How heartbroken do you think God was at that moment? Right. They just wanted the things from God, the blessings there of you go. God, not his presence. Here's the thing that we should be is we should be, and this should be on your slide, we should be passionate about the presence of God, the presence of the Lord, um, then enjoy the blessings that he gives us. I should say this, passionate about the the presence of God first and then enjoy the blessings that he gives us. He will bless, but if we reverse those, if we're passionate about the blessings of God and then we tolerate his presence, our lives are going to be a mess. Mm -hmm. If we're always talking about, I want the blessings of God, but we don't want to be intimate with him, that's not a real relationship. You won't walk a strong walk. You won't pursue holiness. There's no other way around it that we got to pursue his presence first. You won't ever get out of that wilderness. Right. Because you haven't learned. You haven't been refined. You haven't been perfected to him for him to be able to use you the way that he wants to use you. So you're going to continue in the wilderness and you're going to feel like you've gotten less of the blessings of God yeah. because you're still in that wilderness time. It'll be one wilderness after another wilderness right. after another wilderness as we continue to not learn from the last one. And we have a, a very limited understanding, if that's true, we would have a very limited understanding of who God is. Right. Just like if my kids constantly ran away from me, they would have a a very limited understanding of my love for them and the relationship that I want with them. And so many times God's children run away instead of running to his presence. Um, It's just like when John Bevere went through one of his wilderness seasons um, and the first time it was like an absence of God's presence. The second time, um, he had people that wanted him to be, be fired. This is after he, he had gotten a job as a, as a youth pastor. And, and uh, there was those on staff that, that really didn't care for him. And um, I'm going to read to you. I think I'm in page 163. It says, on page 163 in your book, it says, when Jesus ministered, there was no set formula. He spit on he, on some, he laid hands on, on others he simply spoke to. For another, he made mud balls and put them on their eye sockets. Still others he sent to the priest. The list goes on. There's such a surprising variety because Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. God knew the perfect timing and the manner in which each individual could receive healing. So this is what God wants for all of his servants, to bring us to a place where we will do only what we see Jesus do and under his leading, not what we think we want to happen. 
Jesus said in John 20, 21, as a father sent me, so I'm sending you. Jesus did nothing outside the, the father's leading. So in the same way, we must follow Jesus' example. We must live like him, being led by the spirit, walking as only he can lead us. This requires our flesh to be submitted to the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ. And the optimum training ground for the spirit-led life is the wilderness. This challenging environment is where the way of the Lord is prepared. And God said to Moses, after 40 years in the wilderness training, go ahead and read that. That's found in Exodus 3, 10 through 12. Go now, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you. Hmm. And then read on to that next one. I have not sent the... Oh, no. Have a... Says now let's compare this to what God said about people who sent themselves. In other words, in that instance, God sent Moses, but in this one, those that sent themselves. Read um, Jeremiah 23. All right. I have not sent these prophets, yet they run around claiming to speak for me. I have given them no message, yet they go on prophesying. I am against these false prophets. Their imaginary dreams are flagrant lies that lead my people into sin. I did not send or appoint them, and they have no message at all for my people. I, the Lord, have spoken. Wow. That's yeah. ouch. That stings. Mm -hmm. None of us want a message like that from the Lord. And at age 40, Moses was not able to help or profit the children of Israel when he first attempted to deliver them because God had not sent him. It says, even with all the great education, the leadership, the skills, the wisdom Moses had gained in Egypt, without God's support and timing, Moses could not fulfill what he knew God had called him to do. So his vain efforts only resulted in the death of one Egyptian, Egyptian oppressor. Even though his intentions were noble, this initial attempt to accomplish his mission did more harm than good. Right. I really love this example. It's right. just like... Is so real. It says, then after 40 years on the backside of the desert, so this is his desert training, a new Moses emerges who would, not, who would do nothing except what God told him. Now at God's appointed time, under Moses' leadership, the entire army ends up at the bottom of the Red Sea. And that is the difference between our strength and God's strength. An entire army compared to one soldier. So that's pretty powerful. What God can do if we will surrender to him, his timing, his will, his way, and it comes out of, once again, his presence. It comes out of, of experience him, intimacy with him, him speaking into our lives, and then following his leading. And so have a love for God's presence not a love for ministry. Now, I'm not saying you can't love the ministry that he gives you, mm -hmm. but you have to put it in the right order. Right. If you put the love for the ministry ahead of the love for God, then it's, you're not going to be effective. And that ministry is anything. Your ministry could be raising your children. That is the ministry that God gave you. But it's still if you don't have the presence of God first, mm. if your children mean more to you, doing everything that they need than to set some time aside, get up early, go to bed late, whatever, yeah. spend time with God, then you're not going to fulfill your purpose in raising those children. Right. I mean, that's with your job, with whatever it is that your personal ministry is. It's not yeah. always speaking in front of people. And listen to this. If you mix up the order here, and if ministry is the thing that, r that you love the most, and you spend little time in his presence, then that's going to be the thing that dictates your life. Mm -hmm. That is going to be the thing. If you're satisfied with the ministry more than you are, than the presence of God or spending alone time with him, then your moods are going to be going up and down with how things go in your ministry rather than... Um, the, like the circumstances that come at you, uh, you won't be able to handle and deal with them properly because it's out of balance. Right. 
and whether uh, it has to do with um, just like Moses being on the backside of the desert 40 years, God appears to him after 40 years. And then um, it says in Exodus 3, 3 through 4, Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush doesn't burn up. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside, what happened there? God, God, God got his attention. When the Lord saw that he turned aside, he got a look. God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, he said, here I am. God saw that he was more interested in the bush that was burning than anything else. Right, than the social media he was looking at yes. on his tablet. <laughs> yeah, then look, exactly. Then looking at, at whatever had his attention and God had his attention. And Moses says, here I am. That's when Moses gets commissioned to set the people free. Set the people free. So look at John the Baptist in, in Luke chapter 3. Go ahead and read that, Josie. Luke 3, verse 2. Yeah. While Ananias and Sapphira were high priests, the word of God came to the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. So the word of God came to John... When he was where? It says, in the wilderness. That's when the word comes to him. And then let's take a look also in Galatians. Apostle Paul wrote this, and, and Josie, read that, Galatians 1, 11 through 12. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. But it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So this is interesting. Um, could it be that God led Paul to the wilderness? The apostle Paul, he actually led him to the wilderness. Commentaries say, experts say that he withdrew to Arabia for an extended time of prayer, a time of meditation and reflection of his, his encounter at Damascus really pretty much trying to process it. And Arabia appears again in Galatians 4.25 as the location of Mount Sinai. Yes, the mountain of the Lord. That is where God called the apostle Paul to go to. That is where the law, the word of God was given. And that's where God calls Paul not immediately to launch into ministry, but, um, but right away to come alone with him and to put his word in his heart. And that's all he knew. This is where the law was originally given to Moses. And John the apostle, they, they tried to kill him by this. With John the apostle, they tried to do this. With Paul, God pulls him away into Arabia to the mountain of the Lord. With John... Uh, with John the Apostle, they try to kill him by putting him in a boiling vat of oil. And when they pull him out of the boiling vat of oil, he's praising God. And they're thinking, like, we can't kill this guy, so what are we going to do with him? So they put him on the Isle of Patmos. It's a deserted island. And that's where he gets the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's right. They can't undo what God wants to do. If you look at David, he's in the deserts. So that's where he's hiding from being hunted down by King Saul. And that's where God reveals himself. And you get the Psalms like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Right. He becomes the greatest shepherd of all the children of Israel when David, who becomes the greatest king, a king is known as a shepherd who oversees the, the children of God. And that's what David became. And the revelation comes from his wilderness time as the Lord gives him the revelation. This is where God reveals himself. And I know God will do the same for you if you allow him to. So the wilderness is where God brings you to himself. Away from every other distraction. That's right. It was that way with Moses. It was that way with John the Baptist. It was that way with the Apostle Paul. And if you want to be used by God, pursue holiness. 
Remove the things in your life that block your intimacy with God. Make a way for him to just have all of you, all of your heart, and, all, and to surrender yourself completely to him. And spend an extended amount of time walking, talking in his presence and being alone with him and letting him speak to your heart. And I had something in my notes, and it says this. It says, um, identify, and this is kind of like a little homework assignment till we meet again next week. But it says, identify the distractions uh, unique to you. These could include Netflix, um, social media, sports, news. I always throw that in there, you know, your news channel. Make a list of these distractions and put it on your vision board. It says, using a calendar, schedule time within your week to spend time with God. Literally put it on your schedule. Remove things from your calendar that would keep you from spending quality time with God. Make this an extra effort. Make it something that you're going to uh, work really hard on to cut out some extra time to spend alone with God where you actually get alone and you're still and you can hear his voice and you allow him to drop some dreams into your heart of what he wants to do in and through you, of how he can use you in mighty ways. God has more for you, but we got to make the room for his more. And so you got to make room. You got to make time. It doesn't just happen. Right. I think times are changing so that the things that we were ministering through, the ways that we were Mm -hmm. ministering through, is not how we're going to be ministering in the future. Yep. So in order to hear where God is moving and how he is changing, because he's not surprised by this, he has a yeah. plan in all this, and he has a plan for us and you in all this. And um, so, But in order to know where God is moving and how he wants to direct maybe the mission that you were doing that you can't do anymore because yeah. of these times and how he wants to direct it in a new way, you have to get quiet and have to settle in that, in that wilderness and let him refine you and let him redefine your new ministry. Mm, that's right. Refine and redefine. Mm-hmm. There you go. Um, and also, one very important thing, something that Josie and I were very good at, actually, I'm terrible at this, but um, <laughs> is flexible. <laughs> Be flexible for God. Be willing to say, I did things this way, mm-hmm. but God, I can see. That's not the only way. Right. Now it's time for me to be flexible mm-hmm. and do things the new way right. which you have for me to do. Now you're getting into some of the next sessions. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, let God do a work in you this week. Mm-hmm. Spend some time with him. Get alone with him. And we're going to pray with you. And we're just going to believe that that not only is, is God interested in sharing his secrets with you, but I'm going to believe that you are willing to um, remove anything from your life that could hinder that deeper walk with him and that you will pursue holiness. And the result of that will be deeper intimacy, deeper revelation, a revelation of God's secrets and how he wants to fulfill them in your life. So Lord, we pray for each person right now who is just watching, who's tuned in. And Lord, I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you will help them through the refining process. Help them through their desert. And Lord, encourage them. And Lord, help them to see that you have more in store for them. And Lord, give them the desire to remove anything that is hindering their progress with you, hindering their relationship with you, any sin in their life, Lord, and any fleshly desires, expose it, God. Bring it to the surface and help them to see that the things that they may have been, you know, stuck on or or dwelling on are, are not useful. And Lord, that you desire us to be holy so that you can bring in your promises and 
speak into our life. Lord, I pray you'd encourage each person. I pray you'd bless each person. And I pray that we'd be filled with your spirit, God. Filled with a fresh wind of your spirit in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, Tomorrow, there actually will not be a noontime prayer because we're actually going to be driving back to Florida from... um, from South Carolina, so um, we're t- going to take one one week off of that. And but God bless you, and we will see you on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Have a great week.